Welcome, everyone. This is going to be class number three in episode 31 of Kita Redemption. This is called, Are You Ready to Greet the Mashiach? This is part number three. This is the Dvar Malchus of Parshas Chai Yisara. Okay, so here we go. We still have probably another two classes in this. Maybe, um, usually we only do three classes. There's going to be five classes, a whopping five classes, because this is very fundamental. So we have to uh, move ahead. So in last class in the morning, we gave a class, and over there I discussed um, the idea that Mashiach is called a shaliach. He's God's emissary to bring the redemption. He is one, he's connected and inherently bound up with Moshe, with Moses, who was the first redeemer. The first redeemer and the last redeemer together form the powerful agency of God to bring redemption to the world. Moshe wanted that his redemption should be one with Mashiach's redemption. That's why he said, Shlach no tishlach, send in the, in the, uh, through Mashiach, meaning connect me. It shouldn't be two separate redemptions. It should be one long redemption. Of course, it has, it comes in stages. God granted him that. But what we've seen is that Mashiach is a shliach, is a emissary or is a agent of God. And for that reason, the Rebbe is therefore explaining how shlichus, the whole concept of shlichus, is really, from the very beginning, was all about the final mission. So therefore, the shluchim shouldn't think that there was something else to shlichus other than bringing Mashiach. Because shluchim, the shluchim, I mean, the Chabad emissaries around the world. And again, the Rebbe is not only speaking up to the Chabad emissaries. This was during a conference. But he's implying that every single person in the generation is an emissary of God and the emissary of Mashiach now to help bring the redemption, help facilitate the redemption, is they shouldn't think that just bringing Jews close to Judaism for the sake of the light that it brings to the world or doing, you know, or the, the sake of loving a fellow Jew or the, the sake of doing goodness or kindness or the sake of whatever lofty reason stands on its own, that's not the case. It all is part of one ginormous mission. And the mission is the final bringing about of the redemption of the Jewish people and via them the redemption of all of humanity and all of existence and all of creation and all of existence, the ultimate redemption. And therefore, the fact that the Rebbe says that everything else has been done already and now we have to just focus in just with an, inc an incredible concentration and all of our efforts need to be directly towards spreading Mashiach consciousness in this world one shouldn't think that that's just an optional thing or a nice cherry on the top. That is what the shlichus was meant to be from the very get-go. When the Rebbe instituted the concept, this incredible um, um, organization, if you might call this incredible force in the world called shlichus, in which they had a huge banquet just this year, this a few 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 days ago. The shluchim gathers from the entire world, and every year there's a whole commotion. The big pictures are the thousands of shluchim which is an enormous ac accomplishment, the thousands of rabbis that are here representing communities across the world, the most effective force in the Jewish world of a Chabad Shluchim, in terms of globally, it is for one purpose, and that is to bring the redemption, and therefore it needs to be focused on the redemption. Now that we have that, that Mashiach is called a Shliach, the Rebbe is now going to introduce that really this is a 4,000-year four Shlichus, it begins even earlier than Moshe. It begins with Abraham, with Avram Avinu, the first Jew, who last week of the Torah portion, Pasha's Chayasara, was the one who sends Eliezer, his, his servant, <clears throat> to uh, be a matchmaker for his son Isaac, for Yitzchak. And he, uh, Eliezer is the one who travels to Mesopotamia and finds Rebekah, Rivka, and he brings about the Shidduch, so the, 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 this marriage. So the the, the Rebbe now is going to um, clarify how Eliezer, he's the first person who plays the role as shliach in the world. The Rebbe is going to take the mission of Eliezer, as important as it always was, to bring about the first Jewish marriage, and that's of enormous importance, because through the Jewish marriage, as we're soon going to see, comes all the Jewish people, which the Jewish people are the bedrock of creation and the bedrock of the world. So it's extremely, extremely important, but the Rebbe is going to magnify it and give it cosmic significance now. And he's going to show how this shlichus, this agent Eliezer, in him and from him, we can derive and understand the, the essence of what it means a shliach, 
which would mean the essence of our work that we are given right now that has been placed upon each and every one of us to be the agents to bring about Mashiach in this world. So let's let's take a look at what he says. So we find that uh, uh, the, st the brief story is Avram takes his most trusted servant. He makes him. He 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 tells him, "I'm sending you to my homeland. I need to find a wife. My son Isaac is already 40 years old. He needs to get married. He's meant to be the father of the Jewish people. I need to find him an appropriate wife. I don't want you to go to the Canaanite um, families over here. These are all um, people that are." cannot be the mothers of the Jewish people. It has to be someone from my family. Uh, they're a, of a refined, of a refined um, um, genealogy, of a refined stock. And over here you'll find the proper girl. There must be amongst my family girls, there must be someone who God has ordained, we might say, the soulmate for, for, my, for my son Isaac. For Isaac. He sends him. He actually makes him take an oath that he will not um, seek a girl from anyone else other than his family and that he will not take Isaac out of the land of Israel. Yitzchak needed to be, because because um, what's his name, um, Eliezer was concerned, as the verse describes, that maybe Abraham, maybe the, the family will not be willing to send their daughter off. And... Um, and, and and therefore he asked Avram, can I bring, if, if, if she, I can't bring the girl to the boy, should I bring the, the young man to his wife? And Avram said, my son is holy. He's may not, he was already offered as a sacrifice. Um, he was offered up as a sacrifice, although it wasn't, didn't happen, but he was sanctified with the holiness of a sacrifice. He's not allowed to leave the land of Israel. And that's when he made him make an oath. And the story continues. Eliezer goes and Avram goes. But I, 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 Eliezer is sent off. He takes 10 camels. These 10 camels are loaded with enormous amount of gifts and, and, and wealth of Avram. Plus, as the verse says, Avram gave him his entire wealth, which Rashi explains to mean that Abraham gave him a document in which he says that you have ownership now of all of my possessions, my entire estate. Abraham was a very rich person. He says it's all in your hands. And if you need to give dowry, if you need anything to impress upon the family to want to send their daughter, then so be it. Do whatever it takes. I'm empowering you to have full control over my entire estate, whatever it takes, and bring me the girl. Eliezer goes. He doesn't know exactly which girl, but he knows the general rules. It has to be from the family of Abraham. He goes there. He doesn't know where to turn. He offers a prayer. To God and he says, God, show me a sign. He makes a particular sign. The girl that comes out and is going to show generosity and kindness. He's going to ask a girl if she can have a drink. The, girl, the girls of the town were coming out to drink water. He was going to ask girls. He thought maybe he'll have to ask 20, 30 girls until he finds the right one to, 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 to be kind and offer him some water. Not and 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 but a, a girl that's going to respond, yes, here, have a drink. And not only that, looks like you have thirsty camels. I will bring to drink for your camels. That a girl who shows such generosity, this can be the mother of the Jewish people. And this is what happens. He doesn't even finish talking. A young girl, the girls are coming out. Amongst them, he sees this girl. He runs over to her. Bingo. On the first shot, he meets the right girl. It is Rebecca. He asks her. She fulfills what he, what he asks with flying colors. She runs back and forth and back and forth. Now, to fill up a, a water trough. For 10 camels to drink, you've got to imagine it's a whole lot of water. And she's doing it so joyfully. It was amazing. And he was amazed by her generosity. And he realized this is the right girl. He actually gave her a ring, bracelets, and uh, even before he knew who she was. Then he asked her. He took a leap of faith. And he asked her, who are you? Turns out she's from the right family. So then he comes to her house. And he back and forth negotiates. Uh, tells them about who he's coming from. They're impressed by his riches. They say, "Our yeah, we'd be very happy to give you our daughter, but maybe she should stay around for another year over here so she can prepare. Uh, Leezer says, don't hold me back. God is the one who, who has orchestrated all of this. Please send me back to my home. And instantly, um, and, and they said, let's ask the girl if you want to go with this man. And Rebecca says, yes. So then the very next morning, she's sent off. She goes back. She comes to the land of Israel with Eliezer, and over there she meets Isaac, and they get married, and they live happily ever after.
That's kind of the story. And then later they fathered and mothered uh, the two children, Jacob and Esau, as we see in this week's Torah portion. And Jacob, Yaakov being the father of the Jewish people. That's the story in brief. So now the Rebbe says, Eliezer, therefore, is being sent off to do a mission. So the question the Rebbe asks is, we really need to understand what was the halachic criteria? How are we supposed to see Eliezer? Well, how will we characterize him in the role that he played over here? And the Rebbe says there are two possibilities of how to characterize and, 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 and define the state of, of Eliezer in this mission. One way of seeing it is that he's a full-fledged agent. Agent, when we're talking about agent, halachically means, I think the proper term would be power of attorney. In other words, when you give over someone a power of attorney, that means that that person, in regards to whichever aspect you're making them power of attorney, is they become the decision maker regarding certain things. They do not have to gain permission from the, from the actual um, uh, client that they are representing. If they decide that the deal is a good deal, if they decide that the offer is a good offer, they can sign on the paper and their signature is as if and valid and holds the power of the actual uh, person himself. So they can wheel and deal, they can sell, they can buy, they can sign agreements. It is considered the hand of the lawyer, the hand of the attorney is considered to be the hand of the, the, the uh, client. That is the meaning of a shliach. In shlichus itself, the, 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 it's a Talmudic discussion, various different levels of understanding how deeply the, the, the attorney or the agent, in our case, we, you refer to it as an emissary, the shaliach, how deeply bound up and how deeply is he considered the extension of the general rule the sages say is shluchai shal adam kemoisai. The shliach of a person, the agent of a person, is considered like the person himself. There's, however, various levels of understanding of it. Either it means that when he does an action, the action is attributed to the one who sent him, or there's a deeper understanding, not just the action, but his entire power of action. The person himself, his power of action is now considered, let's say, uh, uh, um, individual A is sending individual B to do a, to, for, for a certain project, and he makes him an agent. Let's say he makes him an agent to betroth a woman for him, to marry a woman for him. In other words, a law is in order to establish a marriage, the husband has to give the wife a certain a ring, a certain a value. It's the, the man has to give it to his wife, but I can appoint an agent, and that agent can do it on my behalf. The question is, is it, is it that the act that he does is attributed to person A? Is it that the entire power of action, that right now person B has now hitched his power of action up to person A, so his actions are not being, being done on behalf of person B, but it is being done on behalf of person A, or even deeper than that, not only his power of action, but his entire being, person B, B, the attorney, has now relinquished himself as an independent entity and has now attached his entire self to person A, and he is now literally considered person A. He doesn't have any, for it, of course, in as much as this act is concerned. He is person A. That's how deep the two become one. That's the idea of agency. So that's one way of seeing Eliezer's role over here. Avraham had appointed Eliezer and made him an agent. Or we can say um, Avraham had Isaac, Yitzchak, even though Yitzchak wasn't officially involved over here, appoint Eli openly appoint Eliezer as being his agent. Isaac should have been the one who married who gave the ring and betrothed Rebecca, but Eliezer was doing it on his behalf as an agent. That's one way of seeing it. The other way of seeing it is that he's not playing the role of a power of attorney of an agent. Instead, he is just a matchmaker. Matchmaker meaning he is seeking out and coming back with a suggestion. So-and-so is a nice, I, I think this is the right person. 
here, and then you decide. And then Isaac himself would then later, once the girl comes, in this case, Rebecca, he would decide, yes, marriage and no marriage. In other words, the marriage had not taken effect. And Isaac would later um, have to do the act of acquisition in his wife, of betrothal, by giving her himself the jewelry or whatever it is to affect the marriage. So that would be a matchmaker. He's a third party. He's not in any way empowered with any powers. He was just kind of doing a favor or bringing, you know, being the middleman, being more like a, a uh, what do you call him, a, a broker. He's here to broker a deal, but doesn't have power of attorney. That's the point. These are the possible. Now, the Rebbe wants to say, in the second role, if we say Eliezer was not an agent, it is still possible to say that he, that he had the power to actually do the, the act of the betrothal. He was able to hand her the ring, and she would be betrothed to Isaac, even though he's not an agent. Because in halacha, there is such a concept of a what we call a matchmaker in, 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 in uh, Jewish terms, in Torah terms, it's called a shatchen. It's not an agent. A shatchen is a matchmaker. And the shatchen, but a shatchen, and what does it mean? When we say he's not an agent, it means he, he's working, he is working independently. He's not a, a, an extension of the one who is getting married, not at all an extension. He's considered an independent entity. However, the law is that if I show interest in marrying someone, someone who is not me, see an agent is considered, is, con is con my agent is considered an extension of me. Your agent is considered an extension of you. But that is only if we imply that in order to affect a marriage, the person himself can do it. How about hypothetically understanding that no, if I want to marry something, a second party can off can give the money on behalf of the individual. It's not considered that I myself gave it; someone else did it. But it, that is too halachically okay in affecting the marriage. Obviously, if husband and wife both agree to this marriage. So, in this question, the Rebbe is questioning is basically two two possibilities, which each one of them has variations. One possibility is that Eliezer was acting completely as a shliach. He had full power of attorney, and he was an extension of Abraham or Isaac, and it was if, as if Isaac himself did it. And Eliezer kind of melts, his entire existence melts into Isaac. He's like, now he's, 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 he's part of Isaac in this in this. Or the other option is, no, Eliezer remains an outsider, a separated individual. He's a good broker. He's suggesting. And to take it and to the highest level of, in this possibility, is he might even have had the ability to affect the actual marriage, but not because he was an extension of Isaac or Abraham, of Yitzchak or Avram, but rather just as a shatchen, as a third party. That's the question. These are the two possibilities. Now there is, the Rebbe brings, and there's a lot of footnotes over here, which I'm not going to discuss because we want to move through this. The Rebbe brings that there are different opinions amongst the early Talmudists about this. Meaning, what, number one, the first question over here is, was when Eliezer brought um, Rivka on the camels back to the land of Israel, was... Um, was was she, was Rebecca already considered the wife of of Eliezer of, of of Isaac? Was she already a married woman? In other words, did Eliezer affect the kedushin? Well, one opinion is that yes, and because we find in the stories we mentioned earlier that Eliezer gave her bracelets, he gave her the actual um, um, ring, if you might call it. That constituted already the betrothal and the marriage. She was technically a married woman already. In order for her not to get married or to break her marriage, God forbid, she would have needed a divorce. Or is another opinion that no, Eliezer was bringing a girl, an unmarried girl. When she came to Isaac, Isaac was the one who then affected the marriage. 
So there's two there's there's a question regarding it. The Rebbe is again he brings all this in the footnotes, but the Rebbe is going to give his own evaluation based on you know the reasons to believe so and the reasons to believe so. And let me tell you first the conclusion. The conclusion of the Rebbe is that from the various evidence that he's going to prove, from the various different proofs that he's going to give, is that Eliezer was considered an emissary. He was considered a power of attorney. He was acting on behalf of, Ab of, of Abraham or of Isaac, of Yitzchak. He was an extension, and therefore he is a full-fledged shliach. Now, the reason the Rebbe needs this is because this is going to, this is going to first of all, because this is how he sees it to be the truth. But in the context of what we're talking over here is the Rebbe is building upon this what the whole um, to, uh, um, function of shlichus is and the cosmic significance it has in the entire bringing about the, 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 the purpose of all of creation and, and, and including Mashiach as well, as we discussed earlier. So this is a very important piece of the puzzle that he wants to show, because if Eliezer was just a matchmaker, then the whole thing would fall apart. So the Rebbe is going to prove that he wasn't just a matchmaker. But first, he says, at first glance, when you read the story, it would seem that there are many reasons that are pointing or, or proofs that might be pointing that Eliezer was, not, was, was nothing more than just a broker, just a matchmaker. How do we see that? The, the core principle of a shaliach is that a shaliach, an emissary, is not acting in any way on his own interests. The point of a shaliach means I am now your agent, which means if you're a power of eternity of someone, you better be thinking of their interest. That's why, why would I appoint someone as a power of eternity? Because I know that this individual will have my interest completely um, above everything else. And he will not put his own personal preferences. If he would put his personal preferences, I will never, ever make a person like that, you know, give him the power to represent me. Maybe, okay, I have to pay him money. I'm saying usually a power of attorney, you know, of attorney is because we do, the person does have somewhat of personal. And I'm saying the power of attorney, of attorney is not the perfect example, but it's for, for this, for, for what, for the idea that the that this attorney attorney has the power of the client, we're using it. Now, the idea of an agent is that the agent has set his or herself completely aside to be completely considered an extension of the one who's sending them because because they have no personal. Um, uh, no personal gains over here. It's purely a, an act for the other individual. If that is the case, the Rebbe says, when we take a look at Eliezer's story, we see Eliezer was a little bit stuck, if we might say, in his own interests. One of the things that happened that Rashi points out, the Talmud, the, the, the Midrashic um, story, which we derive, the sages derived from the story, is that when you read the story, you see that Eliezer was hinting to Abraham, to Abraham, when he said, maybe the girl, perhaps the girl will not want to come. He used an interesting word for the word, perhaps. He used the word, ulai. Now, ulai is a word which means perhaps, but it's a type of perhaps where you're wishing that that perhaps should happen. Uh, you could use other words. Let's say, for example, there is a word you can use, pen, the Hebrew word. Pen, which is like pen, like God says, pen yifta levavchem. Maybe your hearts will go astray. Obviously, in that situation, it's like worst case scenario. We don't want that to happen. If God forbid it happens, like God is saying, maybe your hearts will go astray and I'll be angry at you, right? Moshe, right? Um, in, in the Shema, we say that. You see that that's a scenario that we really don't want to happen. Ulai is almost like saying, if only that happens. It's like a it's like when you a person who's who really wants option number one not to work out so that we can go with another plan. So why is Eliezer using the word when he says to Abraham, maybe the world won't the girl won't come? He uses the word ulai. So Rashi derives from here. And again, the Midrash says that Eliezer had a daughter, and he was hoping that there was no other girl that would find, that Abraham would find fit to marry his son Isaac, and his daughter would 
marry Isaac. And then he, Eliezer, would merit to be the forebearer through the matriarch. Um, he would be the forebearer of the Jewish people. Abraham rejected him very strongly. And Abraham said to him, well, don't mess with me. Don't even think. Why? Eliezer came from, was a Canaanite. His, his lineage came from Canaan, from the from Ham, from Canaan. Remember, Noah had Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafes. And we remember the story that Ham was cursed uh, by by Noah because of the because he behaved in an, in a, in a, in a in a inappropriate way when Noah drank and he lay and he laid uncovered, and and Ham and Canaan misbehaved. Shem and Yafes honored their father, and at that time. No, Noah blessed his son Shem and Yafes, and he cursed his son Ham. So Avram is then evokes this and he says, You might be a great person, you're an awesome person, but you're from the cursed family. I am from the blessed family, and we're not a marriage match. And Avram says in these words, the cursed cannot attach itself to the blessed. There is a there is a barrier over here that is not going to be broken. This is the this this is a story. So from here the Rebbe says the very fact that two things from it from, from Eliezer's suggestion and from Abram's answer, you can see that Eliezer seems to be an outsider. The very fact that he's suggesting something and hoping that Abraham's wishes in 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 finding someone from his family does not work out, doesn't look like a person who doesn't have any personal interests involved. He's not someone who has completely surrendered himself just for the well-being and the interests of the one sending him. It seems like he has some, 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 some gain that he's searching for himself. That's not the mindset. That's not the, the headspace of a shaliach, of an agent. From Abram's answer, you also see, because the whole idea of a shaliach means you're connected to me, you're part of me. It's almost like you're my hand. From this that Abram says to him, the cursed cannot become attached to the blessed means to say we are severed. We are you, you're my student, you're close, you're a great guy, but we forever remain separated. Shows a certain distance, which therefore would seem to lend itself into the idea that Eliezer was a good broker, but he remains an outsider and independent force. Another proof, the Rebbe says, to the idea that Eliezer seems to be. It would not be an agent, but rather would be a matchmaker, is from the fact that the way Eliezer had to operate over here, that Avram did not give him a very clear address. You see, if you're working as an agent, you're working just as me, as an extension of me, it would almost seem like I'm giving you explicit directions. Go to so-and-so, go to this house, knock on the door, find me this girl, bring her and, 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 you know, and maybe betroth her for me. You know, give her, you know, bring about the marriage that she... So it's very, you know, you're not leaving spa much space for the agent because the agent is just doing what you're telling him to do. You know, but here you see how much space Abraham gave Eliezer. Eliezer had to do basically the whole thing on his own. He had to go there. He had to offer his own prayer. He made his own sign. He, 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 he was the one who kind of, you know, picked the girl. So there, it, it, there seems to be a lot of space and independence for Eliezer, which seemed to, 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 to show that Eliezer was not completely knotted to Abraham with an absolute knot. So these would be the indicators that Eliezer was a shatchan, was a matchmaker, and he was not a shalim. However, the Rebbe says, we have to look at it now and examine it from the other side. From the other side, there are there is even more indicators, and when we take a look at you know, deeper into the story, it clearly is indicates that Eliezer was an agent and not just a matchmaker. Where do we see that? Number one. Number one, let's take a look first who Eliezer is. Eliezer, number one, is a servant of Abraham. He's literally a servant. And the halachic element is that a servant is an extension anyways of his master. A servant is not an independent being at all. Eved, we're not talking about someone who works for you. He wasn't an employee. He was a servant. He belonged to Avram. In that case, 
the, the sages even use the term Yad Eved Ke Yad Rabbi. The hand of a servant is the hand of his master. Now, Eliezer wasn't just a servant. He was the chief servant, and he was in charge of Abraham's entire estate. So he was literally running, running Avram Shom. In other words, Avram trusted Eliezer to the highest level. So not only did he trust him in his financials and in his physical well-being, he trusted him also with his spiritual self. It, the sages say that Eliezer was called Eliezer from Damasek, simply means he came from Damascus. That's where he was born. But the sages also read the word Damasek as a message. That Eliezer was, it comes from the acronym of the word Doyle Omashke. That means he was the one who was the, Abraham, Abraham was a huge teacher. He was a huge philosopher. But Abraham couldn't sit and teach the thousands of people who came to study from him. And explain everything. So Lee, Abraham would give would give deep teachings, short, concise, deep teachings, and then Eliezer was the one who would take these teachings and then elaborate them and explain them. In the words of the of the of the Medrash, he would he was drawing the waters of his master, and he was the distributor. That means Abraham trusted him, that he would give over the teachings precisely the way Abraham intended it to, Avram intended it to. He was also in charge over his entire house. All of this is indicating how knotted and one Eliezer is and totally, totally um, um, given over to Avram and to Avram's interest completely. He didn't see himself as an outsider. He was very much an insider of Avram's house. More than that, in this particular case, Amram knotted himself with a, even a stronger knot to Eliezer because he placed an oath on him. So the oath meaning a bond, oath actually means almost like to tie yourself. So here, in addition to, to Eliezer being knotted to Avram in his general life, he was so knotted with Avram over here that Avram now knotted himself with an oath. This is all indicating how attached he was. Again, if we're learning that he was a, a, a uh, matchmaker, then the whole point is that he's not attached. He's a self, he's an entity on his own. He, over here we can see he wasn't an entity. And, um, and, and, the more, and, the, and the most, the strongest evidence the Rebbe uh, presents for this, for this argument, to argue that he was an emissary or an agent, a power of attorney, for Abraham, for Avram, and for Isaac, was the fact that Avram, as we mentioned earlier, entrusted his entire estate. He gave everything over to the hands of Eliezer, which is something you do not give to an outsider. You don't give, you know, you know, most people they wouldn't share their bank, their most personal bank information with anybody but themselves if they have money and they have. And they're afraid and they're paranoid. Someone will take it and whatever, transfer money to their bank to in another account or do whatever. These are things that you keep, you know, locked and you sleep on the key. The key is on a safe under your pillow. The fact that Ali Abraham was an extraordinarily rich man, took everything and he gave it all over to Eliezer shows that there was absolute trust. And that is only because he sees Eliezer as himself not as anyone other than himself. And therefore, he can trust him wholeheartedly, his entire money and everything he gave to him. And he gave him, the, the, the Rebbe brings proof. It says that, um, that uh, it says in Midrash, it says he, that, that Abraham said, uh, spoke to Eliezer, to his, his, his servant. Ha, the, the verse says, Hamoishel, the one who rules on on, on every on and everything that belongs to Avram, the Midrash says these words, even if you're going to, even if you squander it, I'm giving you full jurisdiction, so even you can squander it. Obviously squander it for what? He wouldn't give it to him if he's thinking that he's going to squander it and on the way he's going to stop in Vegas and he's going to play on the, uh, he's going to, he's going to try his luck at the slot machines. <laughs> That's not what it means that he's going to squander it. It means I trust you so much that even if you'll throw all my money to make this marriage happen, 
we have no question that all whatever that you're going to do everything on my behalf without even without even the slightest hesitation this is this is all these arguments indicate and are pointing to the fact that Eliezer was a had the had the criteria of a shliach of an agent now let's understand why was that so necessary now that we've established that that's the fact but now we need to now we know the what now we need to know the why why did Eliezer have to be the shliach of Avram which means why did he have to become the agent why couldn't he be a broker you know and then uh, Abraham and Isaac will complete the job on their own. Why did he have to be sent as an agent and be bonded and attached and, and, and bond up and so unified with Avram? Why would that be the reason? So the Rebbe says we'll understand this by first analyzing something else that doesn't make any sense in this story. What does Avram Avinu do over here? What does Abraham do? As we mentioned before, he takes all of his possessions and he gives them to Eliezer and he says, take everything. And it says, which what Abraham did was, he wrote all of his all of his wealth to his son Isaac, and he gave the 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 deed. He gave the document where it says that everything that I own to the very last penny now belongs to Isaac, and Eliezer has control over that. And therefore, for behalf of this marriage, he can use all the money, whatever it would take. If this girl is going to turn out to be a massive princess and she's uh, going to be a very, very, um, she's going to, she's going to cost, well, like good Jewish women who can be very expensive to, uh, <laughs> to, What would be the word? Whatever. In any case, um, the Rebbe asked the question, why would Abraham do that? I mean, we understand. You know, it's very important to him that his son should get married. And his son was no youngster. He was 40 years old already. And he, So Abraham is very determined that his, to, to find Isaac a right, a right match. But Abraham has got a lot of money. He could have given him a hefty check a hefty sum of money, but left some money for himself. This behavior of taking every dollar that you have seems to be reckless behavior. Now, it's considered reckless even according to Torah, even when it comes towards um, righteous activities. We know what the greatest thing you can do with your money is give tzedakah, to give charity. Yet the Torah prohibits a person from giving all that they own to charity. The Torah kind of says the obligation we all have is 10%. If you want to do more than what your obligation is, 20%. But more than that, one should not give for tzedakah. That's what it says. Over here, this is important, but why would Abraham be taking everything that he owns and giving it away? He had enough money to give it a significant amount, but here everything doesn't make any sense. Why would he do that? Especially taking into account that Avraham was not yet finished with his life. You know, if he would be in his deathbed and he's giving it over to Isaac, we understand it's an inheritance. Avraham was still going to live another 35 years, at the half of a, of an, of a person's life. Right? They talk about retirement fund. Avram emptied out his entire retirement accounts, every single one of them, and he gave it. That's 35 years of his elder years. How is he going to take care of himself? Now, to make matters like really worse, Avram, after this, remarries. At the time when Isaac got married, Abraham retakes his old wife, Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, of Yishmael. He remarries her, and then he has another six or seven, I think six children. So he still has a whole family to support. So why in the world is he taking all of his possessions and giving them to Eliezer? It doesn't make any sense. It's reckless. 
sorry, for, for the marriage of, of Isaac. So the Rebbe says like this, on a more spiritual level, we can explain it, on a more mystical spiritual level. If you realize that Isaac, and from the godly perspective, Abraham and Isaac are not two people. They're two faces of the divine, of the divine persona. Abraham is God's face of kindness, and Isaac is God's face of judgment, of severity. Two sides of God. So it's not like he's giving it away to someone else. They are because it says Abraham and Isaac were both a chariot for God. They hollowed out their entire existence. They had no existence of their own. So they're both almost like two limbs of God. So exchanging, if you take your money from your right hand and you put it in your left hand, it's like a person taking from one account and moving the money to another account. That's not prohibited. So Isaac, Abraham moving it to Isaac's account was not really transferring his estate to anybody outside of him. It all is him. That's if we're looking at it from a very deep mystical level where we see them both, Avram and Isaac, as pure, as one with God. However, if we're looking at the story from a more human place, where Abraham is Abraham and Isaac is his son, and a son is very important, and parents should give for their children if they have means to help their children out, and we can understand that that's the right thing to do. But not everything. Not everything, especially if he needs money still to live. So what is Abraham doing? The Rebbe answers as follows. Very powerful answer. This is in chapter 5. And he says like this. This marriage of Isaac and Rebecca of, of Yitzchak and Rivka was not just an important marriage. It wasn't just a personal, a personal obligation for Avram. It wasn't just a personal simcha, a personal joy, a personal a, a, um, um, achievement that now he's going to have grandchildren. It's not what it was. It goes much deeper than that. Abraham knows that he is, and his entire purpose, the reason why he exists in this world, was to father the great nation. The chosen people that are going to be chosen by God are going to receive the Torah and bring the world to its complete realization. That's the Jewish people. And this entire people is going to be, are going to be brought to the world, are going to be, are going to be built. This nation is going to be built through his son Isaac and his wife. This is the first Jewish couple that are getting married as a Jewish couple. Abraham and Sarah, they were first Gentiles. They somehow in their lives made a conversion. But this is the first Jewish couple and this is the marriage that's going to solidify the Jewish people in this world. Therefore, this is not just an important marriage. It's not just a great thing. This marriage facilitates Abraham's entire being and reason for his existence. So if Abraham's existence is to create the Jewish people, and this marriage is going to create the Jewish people, Abraham belongs entirely to this marriage. His entire existence only exists to see to it that this marriage should happen. It's almost as if he lived from the day he was born and every event that happened to him, all of his inspiration and every occurrence that he had in his life and everything he learned and everything he acquired and everything he had and every last nickel and dime, his entire being, every cell of his body was here for this moment that Isaac can get married and here is where the Jewish people can spring forth. If that's the case, we can understand that Abraham's entire self belongs to this marriage. So we can understand why Abraham invested himself entirely in the marriage. There shouldn't even be one piece of Abraham that's outside of it. He has to take his everything and invest it in this because this is who he is. Usually with parents and children, a parent has a life that has significance and importance on his own, unrelated to their children. And we can say the same thing about Abraham. Abraham was a righteous individual that brought a lot of light and influenced a lot of people. 
And Abraham can therefore attribute importance to his life independent. Let's say Abraham would have died childless. He would have had a nice impact on the world. It would have been beautiful. So he has significance other than his child. In that case, now that he has a child, he has to marry him. His children are very important because the fact that he has children, he will have grandchildren, he will continue a legacy, is very important. Add so much to his life. Therefore, we can understand that a huge chunk of his money should go towards that project. But not everything, because there's importance to Abraham other than his, 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 his children and his offspring. But based on what we just said, Abraham did not exist in this world to be a beautiful tzaddik and a nice person that will light up and be inspiration to many. That was not who he was. He was the father. From the day he was born, he was meant to be the father, the patriarch of the Jewish people, the founding stone of the Jewish people. Take away the Jewish people, Abraham is nothing, zero. So therefore, his entire existence belongs to the Jewish people. Where are the Jewish people hinged right now on this marriage? So Abraham takes his entire self and puts it into this marriage. Now, where do we find this, this halachically as well? We find a similarity, the Rebbe says in the footnote, halachically. This that we say a person should not give for charity more than, a, more than 20%. The Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, there is an exception. When you're giving tzedakah because you want to do the mitzvah of tzedakah, you want to do the commandment of, of, of charity, yes, don't give more than 20. Because that's a commandment, but you have a life as well, and you need to fulfill other commandments. And because you need to fulfill other commands, you can't give all your money over here. because You'll be left penniless. You won't be able to do other commandments, and you also won't be able to live normally. So you can't give it everything. You have to give it a lot because for a mitzvah, you're supposed to give a lot. But not everything. And there's restrictions. The Alter Rebbe says, however, when a person realizes that they've wrecked their souls through various different sins, and therefore their soul is a total mess, and their soul needs rectification. And we know there's nothing as powerful to rectify a soul than giving charity. So now the person is giving charity because they know that the purpose of their, of their, of their giving of their tzedakah is simply to heal their soul from the damage that the soul has. So the Rebbe says, that's the Alter Rebbe. And Tanya says, that's not called squandering for tzedakah. Just like a person, everybody will argue that if a person is ill and there's a medication, there's a, a wealthy person, they're, they're on their deathbed, literally, they're very ill. Every, all the doctors has given hope, hope. But there's one medication. But the medication costs $5 million. And this person has $5 million and $1 in their, in their, that's the entire possession. Will anybody say, no, don't give the five million? It's 100% logical that a person should spend the entire five million dollars so they get their medication and they can live. Because you're not, it's not giving it away. This is for yourself to live, to save your life. So you see, in the same way the Alter Rebbe says, to save your life spiritually, your soul, your soul is not worse than your body, you're allowed to give every dollar you have. So that idea and that thought is now what we are saying over here. Applies right now over here. In this case, Abraham was not giving this to Isaac. This was who he was, this marriage. He gave it his entire self. Based on this, we'll understand why if Abraham had to be all in, he had to be in it entirely, so if he was going to choose Eliezer to be the one who was going to actually work on his behalf to bring about this marriage, Eliezer was not going to be... Well, Eliezer would only be able to be involved in this thing if Eliezer as well is going to be all in. In other words, this, this project requires an entire immersion. There isn't even one here one tiny here of your existence that is outside, that is outside. Everything needs to be part of it. So Eliezer could not be a, 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 um, a broker, a matchmaker. A matchmaker means <coughs> I have my life 
I have my business. I have my interests. I care about you. I want to help people out. I see a suitable possibility where I can help you find your right match. And I know that if I'll make the, there's a custom that when a matchmaker suggests a match and it, and, and it comes to fruition, the matchmaker is paid. You're supposed to pay a matchmaker. Whatever, you know, people give certain amounts to matchmakers. There's a fee. So the guy's thinking, you know, I'll make a fee as well. If it's a rich family, you'll make more money. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a business. That means that you're not in it completely. You have your own interests. You're kind of... You're, you're investing, but there is part of you that's outside of it. Eliezer could not be part of it outside of it. Because, as we see, Avram Avinu gave it as everything. The Shidduch required, because of the importance of it, the entire existence should be given. Eliezer has to be a somebody and become completely the, the extension of Abraham. Eliezer as well had to be all in. 1,000%. Now, the Rebbe says, I'd like to explain this, the Rebbe says, on a more mystical, spiritual level. This was explained very simple. We understand what was, what was at st stake over here, what needed to happen, why it required an entire immersion to appreciate this on a deeper level, on a mystical level. This marriage was not just the physical um, the physical enabler for the Jewish people to be born in order for there to be Jacob and then late Jacob later has the 12 tribes. 12 tribes turn into 70 people. 70 people go down to Egypt. The Jewish people become 600,000 men. They come out of Egypt as 2 million people, 600,000 men, 2 million people. They go to Sinai to receive the Torah and then the rest is the story of the Jewish people in history which is just coming to its final conclusion with the coming of Mashiach. So technically, it had to start with a couple that got married and have children. But the marriage, that's of course, but really on a deep level, this marriage of Isaac and Rivka, Yitzhak and Rivka, contained within itself the entire spiritual dynamics of the purpose of creation, the purpose of the entire world, and the purpose of all of Judaism. It's not only a marriage of two physical human beings. It represents two forces in the universe that the fusion of these two forces is what the Torah is all about. The Torah coming to the world through the Jewish people and the purpose of what the Torah needs to achieve is a fusion of these two forces. The personification of these two forces, the seeds that contain, the physical seeds that contain these two cosmic forces are Isaac and Rebecca. When you bring Yitzhak and Rivka together and you cause that marriage, what you really did was in the seed level, you just brought the Torah to the world and you just brought the Mashiach to the world and you realize the entire existence, the entire purpose of creation. So this was an enormously powerful event. That's why we find something really interesting. The Alter Rebbe, by the way, this is a teaching from the Alter Rebbe, Shneer Zalman of Liadi, in the book Lakuti Torah, and the Rebbe is going to talk about later, it's not to be found in Pasha's Chayasara where it should have been found, it is to be found in the end of Lakuti Torah and Pasha's Vezosa Brach in Deuteronomy. In his last discourses in the entire book over the years where he talks about this fusion and explains the cosmic significance. But over there he explains that to see how important this story is, the sages are troubled by the Torah's elaborate discussion of this marriage, of Eliezer's work to bring about this marriage in a way that we don't find other places in the Torah. Generally, the Torah's descriptions are very brief. Midrash, the oral law, expounds. But the Torah is very short and concise. 
many laws of the Torah, entire tractates of law, are derived from just a little nuance, a little extra letter. We derive entire major subjects or major um, 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 sections of Jewish behavior, of Torah observance, are derived from the tiniest little nuances of Torah. You see how, how short and concise the Torah is. Yet in this story, you find an enormous scene seeming to be superfluous narration. Why? The Torah relates how Eliezer takes the camels and goes down and the whole test that he makes. And finally he finds Rebecca and he makes the test with her and he drinks and how excited he is and fine. He comes to the house of Rivka's family. They say to him, who are you? He says, I am the servant of Abraham. And then he goes and he relates the story. When the Torah relates the story, it repeats the entire story over another 10, 15, 20 verses. Exactly what you read, he just Eliezer repeating. I left my, 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 my family, my, fa my, my, my master. I'm a servant of Abraham. My master has children. Had a, I'm sorry, he didn't have any children. And finally, he had a child and his elder. And this child needs to get married. My master spoke to me. It goes through the entire conversation that Abraham had with Eliezer, which we read already earlier when it says that Abraham spoke to Eliezer, now it repeats the entire story again and Eliezer telling it over to the family and how he took the camels and how he went and everything that happened with an extra 20, 20 or 25 verses. It's astounding. Sages say why? So the sages say, this comes to teach you, that, the sage, that, the, that our patriarchs are so great that the story about their servants surpasses the, the Torah of the children. To show you how much greater the patriarchs are from the children, that we're considered so small compared to them, that a story about their servants is discussed in such an elaborate way more than our own Torah. That's the simple story. That's what the sages say. The Alter Rebbe explains it on the deep level. And he says like this, all the Torah that the children are going to do, all the, all the mitzvot that we're going to do are going is all about the fusion of God and the world. When you do a mitzvah, that's what you're doing. You're fusing God and the world. How, however, you're fusing, a person is fusing a little energy of the, a little download of God and connecting it to a little piece of the world. And from all these little pieces that we put together, we have the grandeur, complete picture, the full manifestation of God in the days of Mashiach. It's all through these bits and pieces, these crumbs of goodness and holiness of mitzvahs that we all do the collective um, of all these details, put it all together, and you have the enormous godliness of the future. What, are, what is every mitzvah doing? Every mitzvah is fusing Hashem in the world. Now, here's what the Alter Rebbe says. Well, that fusion of God and the world in the collective, in the seed, in the potential, is the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca. Because Isaac represents God. Because Isaac, we're going to see, is the epitome of holiness. He's born to the greatest tzaddik. When the tzaddik is already past any physical desire, the tzaddik is already at the peak of holiness. Abraham is 99 years old. He's after his circumcision. He's the holiest of the holiest can imagine. Sarah is also past childbearing age. She can't even have a child. The two of them's union, who can even understand? The soul that they brought down is the holiest soul ever to live. The soul that has the capacity to make the entire world laugh. Isaac is the laughter of the future. His soul is on the levels that incomprehensibly how holy he is. He grows up by Abraham and, 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 and Sarah educating him. He reaches a point where he's, he's, he's worthy to be become a sacrifice and brought on the altar. Usually, usually human sacrifices are not okay. But in this case, Isaac is an exception. He's so holy, he's ready to melt into God. That's how holy he is because he's the purest of the pure, the holiest of the holy. He represents the seed of almost of Hashem in this world. That's who he is. Rebecca is three years old, growing up amongst a very, very, very dirty, filthy family. Her father was a child molester. That's who he was. He was a rapist. That's who he was. He was the town rapist. I believe the story. So they just say that every time anybody in that area was getting married, Besuel would come and make the bride 
have relations with him first before she would be allowed to her groom. He was a corrupted monster. That was her father. Her brother is the chief con artist in the world called Love and Harami, an idolater, a pagan, and a wicked, sly liar. Okay, so she's growing up. She has no education of any refinement. But she's a diamond in the rough. She's the potential. She's the divine potential that is stuck in the muck. She represents the sparks of holiness that are in the world, waiting to be elevated. She's the goodness that's within the world, within the darkness. The marriage of Isaac and Rebecca is the fusion of the holy of holies with the lowest elements that are in the world but have a potential to be uplifted. And their marriage is the forebearer of the giving of the Torah in which divinity, the pure divine, is channeled into this world and it latches itself onto the divine potential, the sparks of holiness that are embedded in the, in the unholy dark world, the sparks of holiness. The fusion of these two, that's this marriage. Before this marriage, it would have been impossible. This is kind of what, in there, when, when Eliezer brought this marriage together, he actually laid the framework and the foundation for the Torah to be given. That's why the sages actually say that when Eliezer took the two bracelets and he put it on, on, on Rivka's arms, these two braces represented the two tablets because they each they weighed 10, 10, 10 gold coins, which represented the 10 commandments. So in a nutshell, he was unifying these two dynamic forces. In the words of the Rebbe in the Sicha, these two forces are called Ma and Ban. Ma is the extension of God into the world. Ma is an energy that is an extension of God into the world. Ban is the sparks of holiness that are embedded in the actual darkness of the world. That's called the Ban. These are two mystical names of God. One is the source of divine projection. The other one is the source of the, 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 divine, the divinity that is taken hostage and stuck within the world. And the fusion and the elevation of both is what Eliezer needed to do. Because this was so fundamental, it required, and now we will understand why Abraham was going to give his entire self to it, and why Eliezer had to be a shaliach. We'll leave it for the next class, because a shaliach, the concept of a shaliach itself um, personifies this fusion as we're going to see too soon between these two dynamics of Ma and Ban. We'll leave it for the next class as Rosh Hashem. Thank you.